And now, in the name of our loving, liberating, and life-giving God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, good morning. <laughs> That's an understatement. Good morning. <laughs> It, it really is a joy, um, um, a privilege, and a blessing to be able to be here for the church to gather, to give God thanks, and to pray God's blessing not only on us, but on this world and the entire human family. Allow me before saying a few words in the... Okay, all right. <laughs> Before the sermon, <laughs> I, I do want to take a, a point of personal privilege to say um, I am looking forward to working with my sister, the president of the House of Deputies. We have spent some time together already this summer, and I am looking forward to great years ahead, my sister. Thank you for your leadership. Yeah, we're going to do it. I also want to say a word of thanks on your behalf for Dick Shorey. He is the spouse of our presiding bishop. Well, no, no, the other presiding bishop, the other one. <laughs> right. <laughs> and in a time when there is often debate and genuine consternation as to whether or not courageous, effective, and faithful leadership is even possible, the Episcopal Church can say to the world, we have had a leader, and her name is Catherine Jeffert Shorey. It is an understatement to say that we live in a deeply complex and difficult time in the life of the world. Life is not easy. The old saying used to go, it ain't easy being green, and it ain't easy being human and it never has been and never will be. This is a time when, again, it is an understatement to say that there are challenges before the church and communities of faith. This is a time of difficulty and hardship for many, a time of goodness and joy for others, and a time when we must even find ways to save the Mother Earth, who is the mother of us all. These are, as Dickens said of his time, the best of times and the worst of times. But that's all right. See, we follow Jesus. And you remember what he said at the Last Supper? Now, I know you weren't there, but it's in the book. <laughs> in John's version of the Last Supper, before, this is just a few hours before Jesus would be arrested, he said, in this world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. 
I have overcome the world. Or as that great biblical scholar and exegete said, his name was Bobby McFerrin. <laughs> Don't worry, be happy. <laughs> Don't worry, be happy. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. Don't worry, be happy. Let me give you a text. Now, y'all may have to get used to this. I have a dialectical relationship with the passages that were read earlier. But this text is directly related to all three. From the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 17. When the angry crowd could not find the apostle Paul and Silas, they dragged Jason and some other believers before the city authorities, shouting, now this is a description, I think this is one of the first descriptions of the followers of Jesus. These people who have been turning the world upside down have come here also. They are acting contrary to the decrees of the emperor saying there is another king named Jesus. Oh, I'd love to see the Washington Post talk about the Episcopal Church that way. <laughs> what you have there is a first century description of the Jesus movement. These people who have been turning the world upside down, which is really turning it right side up, have come here also. They say there's another king and another way following Jesus. That's the Jesus movement. A few centuries later, about the 19th, Julia Ward Howe, in the midst of the ambiguities and the uncertainties and the tragedies of America's civil war, sensed and saw that same movement present again. And she said, in the beauty of the lilies, Christ was born across the sea with a glory in his bosom that transfigures you and me. As he died to make folk holy, let us live to set all free while God is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. God's truth is marching on. That's a Jesus movement. Stay with me, I'm coming to it. And I want to suggest that what was true in the first century and true in the 19th century is equally and maybe more profoundly true in this new 21st century. What God has done in the past, God can do again. The God who parted Red Seas can do it all over again. The God who raised the dead to life can do it all over again again. So don't worry. <laughs> Be happy. God has not given up on the world. And God is not finished with the Episcopal Church yet. The, the great liberating truth, I think, um, it, of this Jesus movement is that actually it takes some of the burden off of us as well as some of the ego off of us. Be because the truth is, Jesus did not come into this world to found a religion. He really did. Religious faith is important. Don't y'all go out here saying the new presiding bishop said religion is no good. I didn't say that. <laughs> But he didn't come here to found a religion, though religious faith is critical, nor did he come here to establish an institution or an organization. Um, you will not find much of an organizational structure um, or a diagram of who's accountable to who um, in the New Testament at all. But organizations and institutions can serve his cause. No. 
Jesus did not come here to found a religion or to start an institution. Jesus came to inaugurate, to begin, to catalyze a movement. A movement that could change and transform this world from, from the nightmare it often is into the dream that God intends for all of us. He came to start a movement. No, no. he came to continue a movement. See, Jesus picked up where John the Baptist left off. And John the Baptist left off where Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and, and, and Habakkuk and Obadiah and Nahum, y'all hadn't heard of those prophets, had you? Uh, but they're there, where, where, where the prophets of Israel left off. And they picked up where Moses had left off. And Moses climbed and went to the mountaintop and took folk to the promised land. Oh, Jesus was picking up the baton of a movement. And that movement is to transform this world. See, that's what, that's, that's what Isaiah was talking about. God's dream of transforming this world from its nightmare into God's dream where the wolf will lie down with the lamb, where they will not hurt or destroy in all God's holy mountain, for the earth will be filled with the glory of God as the water covers the sea. When God has God's way, folk don't hurt each other. When God has God's way, people don't kill each other. When God has God's way, we don't let children starve. When God has God's way. God's got a passionate dream. Vernadosia taught us this years ago. God had a passionate dream for this world when God said, let there be anything, a dream that, that one day there would be a new heaven. This is in Revelation 21. Uh, oh, let the world, let the record note that the Episcopal Church was quoting the book of Revelation. <laughs> Revelation 21, you see, John has this vision from his prison exile on Patmos, and he says, Behold, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven like a bride adorned for her bridegroom. And the dwelling of God was now with human beings, and they hungered no more, they suffered no more, no more war, no more violence, no more injustice, no more indignity but God's love is all and all but we got a God who's got a dream for this world Jesus came to show us the way out of the nightmare into the dream for us all that's what's going on in the lesson from Acts they were talking about this dream and folks say you must be crazy but that's what's going on. They said, you know, these people who have been turning the world upside down all over the Roman Empire, we've heard rumors of them, they've actually come here also in Thessalonica. Um, and, and, and part of the reason that they seem to be turning the world upside down in this movement is they are following another king beside the emperor Caesar, which is a way of saying this Jesus and his way actually does turn our world and the world upside down, which is actually right side up. Got on a plane earlier this week and uh, I was flying to, leaving Raleigh, North Carolina, was, was going to New York to um, spend a couple of days there and, and to spend a day with Bishop Catherine on, on the Tuesday. And we had a we had ourselves a good time. We really did. Anyway, on the plane, on the, on the flight up, um, we were, I mean, I was in, you know, a little bitty plane, and, and um, we hit some turbulence, which is normal on planes. And uh, as I was flying, something said, Michael Curry, do you have any idea what you are about to do? <laughs> And, and then one of those moments of reality where it gets real, where I, I'm going to tell you the truth, where I said, you haven't got the foggiest idea what you're supposed to do. And sort of a cross moment of quasi terror. And then I thought, well, maybe I could negotiate with Catherine. I could be the Poseidon Bishop Coadjutor for a little while <laughs> and, and get her to stay on for a little bit longer. 
Um, and then I really did kind of, I mean, I didn't break out in sweats, but I remember it was in, this is all going it's on inside my head. And I realized that we're hitting the turbulence and there I was in this little bitty plane, you know, they're not that big anymore and the seats aren't that big. And I was strapped in, you know, they got you strapped down almost like, you know, you're in surgery or something. And there I was on the bouncing and the plane was bouncing. I said, is this a parable of the next nine years? <laughs> And after a while, I, you know, something just, this thought really did pop into my head. It literally, actually, it was my godmother's voice and, um, where she would say, all right, buddy, bucko, get over yourself. And something did say, Michael Curry, it's not about you. See, you thought you came here for the installation of the 27th presiding bishop and primate. That was just a teaser to get you here. The real reason we are here was at the beginning of this service when we renewed our vows of baptism to renounce Satan and all that hurts and harms the human family and God's creation and to turn to Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord and to become the Jesus movement in this world. That's why we're here. That's why we came, because that movement turns the world up. Am I making some sense so far? Is this that, that, yeah, that, that movement has the power to, 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 to take things which had been cast down and raise them up. It has the power to take things that had grown old and make them new. It has the power to, to give life to, to God's church and God's people. It has the power to give, to give life to this world. That, that, that movement is why we're here. We are the Jesus movement. And we've been sent and called into this world not to settle for what is, but to dream and work for what shall be. How did George Bernard Shaw say it? Some men see things as they are and ask why. We who follow Jesus of Nazareth dream things that never were and ask why not? Why not a world where children do not suffer? Why not? And that's what Jesus was getting at when he said in those Beatitudes from the Sermon on the Mount, Bless, I'm talking about a different world, he was saying. I'm talking about a different way of being. It's not an accident that, I'm going to land the plane in a minute, don't worry. Um, but it's not an accident that the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes that were our gospel actually follow Jesus calling the first disciples, telling them, follow me and I will make you fish for people. Follow me and I will show you a life that you didn't know you could have. Follow me and I will show you a life of dignity, integrity, vitality. Follow me and I will show you that love is the only way. Because when you follow me, Blessed are the poor and the poor in spirit. When you follow me, blessed are the merciful, the compassionate. When you follow me, blessed are those who hunger and thirst that God's righteous justice might prevail. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are you when you are persecuted just because you tried to love somebody. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for so they persecuted the prophets. Before you love your enemies, bless those who curse you. Pray for those who despitefully use you. This way of Jesus really does turn the world upside down. And I can show you how. You remember, Jesus spent a lot of time with lawyers. <laughs> Got a feeling there are a few in here. <laughs> I know there are from North Carolina. I know there are a few of y'all in here, but that's all right. But, but, but Jesus spent a lot of time with lawyers, and some of his best conversations were in the critical, conversational, almost Socratic engagement with the questions of lawyers, sometimes those wanting to know and sometimes trying to trick him. And you'll remember it was on one occasion where one lawyer came to Jesus and said, great teacher, in the entire legal edifice of Moses, um, what is the greatest of all the laws in the law of Moses? And Jesus pulled back, reached back to Deuteronomy and Leviticus and pulled together two passages 
of Moses. And he said, this is it. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. This is the first and the great commandment. And the second is like unto it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two, love of God, love of neighbor, hang all the law and the prophets. Everything Moses was talking about, all the justice that the prophets proclaimed, everything that's in the Bible is all about love of God, love of neighbor. That love will turn this world upside down. And if it's not about love, it is not about God. This, this thing will really turn the world upside down. I'm telling you, I'm not talking about a Hallmark greeting card right now. Uh, we're talking about the most dynamic reality in all of creation. This love turns the world upside down. And I can prove it to you. You remember the parable of the Good Samaritan? Uh, Y'all remember the parable of the Good Samaritan? <laughs> <laughs> now, that's in, in Luke's gospel, in Luke 10, where... Jesus and a lawyer got into a, a discussion and, and uh, um, you know, they got into the, they came to an agreement that, uh, a mediated agreement that, um, the, that Moses basically taught love of God and love of neighbor is the whole thing. And so the lawyer did a lawyerly thing. He said, okay, well, great teacher, I will concede that love of God and love of neighbor is the whole thing, um, but that could have far-reaching impact. So could we be more precise in our language? Could we narrow down or clarify the definition of neighbor. How expansive is it, or better, how inclusive do you mean? And that's when Jesus told the parable. You remember the story? Okay, y'all were scaring me. Uh, we only got nine years. I mean, you know. It's... Anyway, you know, the guy was walking, somebody was walking from Jerusalem to Jericho, and they fell among, the guy fell among thieves, remember, is beaten up, and um, you know, a, a religious leader came by and saw him beaten up, but just kind of went on the other side. And uh, another prominent citizen came by and walked on the other side. And a third one came by and did the same. And then a Samaritan, who was like somebody that people didn't agree with, basically, this Samaritan came along and he saw the guy in need and went over and helped and bandaged him up, took care of him, um, took him to a hospital, paid his bill. Lord have mercy, yeah, paid his bill and made sure the guy was cared for. And Jesus then said to the Lord, now who was the neighbor to the man? See, Jesus didn't fall for his question. He said, no, 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 who was the neighbor to the man? He said, the one who showed compassion. Jesus was telling him, that's what God is like and that's what God wants you to be like. Now, change the story just a little bit. A Christian was walking on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. Yeah, you're getting Episcopalian on me now. You got quiet. You know I'm coming somewhere, right? Yeah, this, this Christian was walking on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among thieves and was beaten up. And another very prominent Christian, you know, maybe a bishop, you know, came by, <laughs> saw him on the other side and said, you know, I got a ring, I don't want to lose it. So he just went on. Anyway, another one, you know, another prominent Christian, I mean, somebody came by, saw him and was nervous about getting involved and just kind of went on. And the third one did the same thing. And then a brother or sister who was Muslim came by. Help me, somebody. See where I'm going now? That's what Jesus is trying to teach us. A uh, Muslim brother or sister came by and saw their fellow human being in need and went and took care of them and brought healing into their life. Who was neighbor? That's what God is concerned about. Or change it even more. A police officer was beaten and wounded. And it was an African-American young man or a Latino young man or woman who brought healing or flip it. We could go through a variety of groups that I'll get in trouble. But you see what Jesus is talking about? 
He's talking about turning this world upside down, which is really right side up by the incredible energy and creativity and life-giving power of the love that comes from God. That's what can save us all. That's what can save this planet. That's what can lift this church up and set us on fire. I am. I'm going to sit down um, soon. Uh, I promise. <laughs> I promise. I promise. Last summer, this past summer, at the general convention of our church, I think the convention did a remarkable thing. If I heard our general convention, which speaks for our church, I heard our gener general convention invite us as a church to say, take this Jesus movement seriously and for real. And I heard a call from that general convention, a call for evangelism and a call for reconciliation, to work for evangelism, sharing the good news of Jesus, and to work for reconciliation, beginning with racial reconciliation, to cross the divides that separate us. I was talking to a friend about this, and I said, you know, it really was remarkable. It was, there, there was a sense of coherence. There really was. I got a feeling the Holy Spirit really did show up. I really do. And um, it was just remarkable. And I was telling a friend about this, and, and she responded. She said, you all want to do what? I said, well, we could do evangelism and racial reconciliation and all the reconciliation that comes, follows from that. She said, you were talking about doing two of the most difficult things for a church to do. Imagine for a second, um, you're watching Jeopardy or a game show. And the question is, two words in the English language that begin with E that are rarely heard in the same sentence. I have a feeling evangelism and Episcopalian probably would be a good candidate, right? <laughs> So you see that, and, and then uh, if you think about reconciliation, beginning with racial reconciliation, we are talking about crossing the great divides that have separated us as the human family of God, the divides of race and class and sexual orientation, the divides of our politics and our ideology, all of the divides that have separated the children of God who are meant to be God's one human family. This is the most difficult work imaginable. But I'm here to tell you we can do it. I'm here to tell you we can do it because evangelism is not what other people say it is. Evangelism is sharing the faith that is in you and listening and learning from the faith that's in somebody else. It's not just about you talking. It's about listening and sharing. It's about a relationship where God can get in the midst and not us controlling the outcome of the relationship, letting God do the controlling and take somebody where God wants them to go. Yeah, that's, that's what we're talking about. And, 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 and this reconciliation, beginning with racial reconciliation, we're talking about finding ways to move beyond, as that great prayer from the prayer book, beyond our struggle and confusion to God helping us to become God's human family, beyond race, beyond class, beyond politics, beyond social economic, beyond education, because in Christ, there is no east, no west. In him, no south, no north. And in this work of reconciliation, we can join hands with others. We do so as followers of Jesus, as the Jesus movement. And we join hands with our brothers and sisters of other Christian communities. We join hands with brothers and sisters of other religious traditions and faith. We join hands with brothers and sisters who may be agnostic or atheist 
or who just may be on a journey, we join hands with all people of goodwill to work for a world where the earth is clean and whole again, where children do not starve, where justice really does roll down like a mighty stream, where every man, woman, and child is treated as a child of God, both in the eyes of law and in the eyes of us all. We can join together with other people about that, precisely because we follow Jesus. And we can do it because the Holy Spirit has done evangelism and reconciliation before. That's the advantage of being in a movement. It's not on us. In the late 1940s, when uh, the armed forces of our country had not yet been desegregated, long before Brown versus Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas, long before Rosa Parks stood up for Jesus by sitting down on the bus, long before while Martin King was in seminary, and Jackie Robinson had just started playing baseball in the major leagues, an African-American couple went to an Episcopal church and they were the only people of color in the room. This is in the great heat of segregation and separation of the races. And they went to the church. The woman was, had become an Episcopalian. The man was studying for the Baptist ministry. And they sat there. Now, this is the old days of the 1928 Book of Common Prayer. And the service went along fairly normally. And then he got to communion. And a woman had told her fiance, they were just engaged at the time, you know, when it comes time for communion, I'll go up and you can just sit here or you can go up and get a blessing. And he said, well, I'll just sit here and see what happens. And um, the, you know, the priest did Eucharistic prayer and all of that. And they were prepared for communion for people to go up. Gifts of God for the people of God. And then people came up one by one and, or came up and knelt at the altar rail. The priest, you know, took the bread, the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, given to thee, preserve thy body and soul unto everlasting life. Take and eat this and remember that Christ died for thee and feed on him in thy heart by faith with that. Y'all remember that? Somebody remembers that, right? Yes, yeah, somebody remembers that. Yeah. And, and that went all fine. And um, then the moment came when the fiance, African-American woman, she got, came up to the altar rail and everybody else was not um, black. I was trying to figure out how to say that delicately, but they weren't black, right? <laughs> and so that was okay while the bread was getting passed out, but then, then the chalice came. And the man looked up and saw there was just one cup. And it had wine in it too. But the wine wasn't the issue. It was just one cup. And he watched as the priest in those days, we didn't have Eucharistic ministers, the priest did it all. Anyway, in, in those days, uh, the, the priest came, the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ shed for thee, preserve thy body and soul and heaven, like dream, drink this, and remember that Christ died for thee, and feed on him in thy heart by faith with thanksgiving. And so the priest did that, goes to each person. Then he got to the lady before um, the woman, gave her the cup, and then he gave the cup to the fiance, the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ given for thee, and the man looked out as if to say, I'm going to see what's going to happen now. See, this is before Brown, Brown versus Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas. Jackie Robinson was just breaking into the major leagues. Martin Luther King was still in seminary. Rosa Parks hadn't stood up for Jesus by sitting down on that bus. The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ given for thee, and the fiancé took it, and then he looked. The next person, the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ given for thee, preserve thy body and soul. Take and drink this in remembrance that Christ died for thee, and be thankful. And he was dumbfounded. And years later, he would say that he joined the Episcopal Church because he really hadn't imagined that that could happen in America. And he said, any church 
where blacks and whites drink out of the same cup, know something about the gospel I want to be a part of. Holy Spirit has done evangelism and racial reconciliation before in the Episcopal Church because that man and woman were the parents of the 27th presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church. God's children, all of us, no matter our race, no matter our religion, no matter our class, our stripe, our type, we're God's children. And we are God's baptized children who are part of Jesus' movement to change this world by the power of love. God really does love us. God actually cares about us and this world. And God has not given up. And if God has not given up on this world, we dare not give up on it either. And God is not finished with this church. God has work for us to do. Jesus has shown us the way, and we are the Jesus movement. So my brothers and sisters, walk together, children. Don't you get weary, because there's a great camp meeting in the promised land. Don't worry. Be happy. God love you. God bless you. And God hold us all, always, in those almighty hands of love. God bless you.